Hello. Welcome to any combo lords joining me here today for a little bonus live video where we're going to talk about some topics such as exponentiation in the modular realm and how this applies to clocks, uh, some hints towards some symmetrical patterns that some viewers were wondering the answers to in one of my recent videos, a little bit of nature where I want to show something interesting growing in the front yard in the springtime, and some other random chatting. As usual in these live streams, we aren't going to be as focused as a main channel combo class episode, but I do have one of those coming this weekend as well. It is about another base for those who like my things about alternate bases, a base that isn't one of what I call the basic bases, like base 2, 3, 4, etc., using the digits 0 through 1 under them and the typical rules. Not one of those, but a base that is very applicable and powerful in math and possibly society. So that'll be fun. Also has connections not only to being a weird base, but to how does this apply to real computers, how does this apply to our world? And Threevens show up, and other things show up. So that'll be coming this weekend. It's very mathematical, about 19 minutes, but also contains some of my favorite chaos-style scenes that we've done in combo class. So for those who like the uh, chaotic nature, I think you'll enjoy this one as well. Now. There's a few videos on this channel that now I almost wish I put on the Combo Class channel because they've done so much better on here, and I do see this as almost my bonus channel, despite it having so many more subscribers than the other. But sometimes the bonus stuff, to me, is the stuff that the most people want to watch. Either in the past, typically the shorts, which to me feel like a little bonus treat in between the lessons, are what has gotten by far the most views out of my videos. And then now a few videos like my multiples of seven one and my new what digits do square numbers never end in one are blowing up pretty good compared to what I expect usually because those are pretty simple, clickable topics, I guess. I guess on the main channel, when you see a, a title like The Perplexing Patterns of Palindromic Numbers, it's not as clickable to the average, you know, half-enjoyer of math as <laughs> why seven is weird. But in any case, that's cool. To anybody who is new from those videos, welcome to the chaotic combo world where we are now in grade negative two. But I think you'll enjoy catching up on grade negative one as well. And in this casual live stream, as usual, feel free to leave any questions or comments in the chat. I see a bunch of hellos and welcome to you all. And to any other questions and such, I will get to those in between our topics. Of course, you know, I get distracted during our live streams here, and it is a more personal, uncut version than a video on its own, but I will try and make sure during my uh, live streams that I get the timestamps in not too long after the li live stream ends, so for people who miss some stuff or don't want to watch the whole thing, not long after the stream ends, and probably before it posts as processed fully, I'll get those timestamps in. Now, what we're going to think about to start today is in that last video I made about square numbers, last digits, and what they can never end in, people noted that there was a symmetrical pattern that we're going to speed run through again. And the speed run through it is that if we look at what a last digit itself could square to make another last digit, well, we just have to look at the last digit of the squared result. And so we had, uh, okay, are any of these pens going to work? No. No. I have so many dead pens. And, uh... I need to order a new batch of living ones. There's got to be a working pen around here somewhere. Uh-oh. Oh, 
Oh no, this is like a permanent marker or something. So, let's see. There's got to be a marker not not far from here. Okay. I really need to order a new batch of those markers. Maybe this one? Good enough. It's pretty light, but it'll work. So, what we're going to have here is the last digit you could have in our base is like zero makes zero, one squares to end in a one, two, four, three, nine. Now here's where it gets a little weirder than just squaring the number. If a number ends in four, we square that last digit to get 16. You do carry a one from that 16, but the six is what affects the last digit. Five ends in five when we square it. Six ends in six when we square it. Seven gives us nine. Eight gives us four. And nine gives us one. Now, let's note something here, which is a lot of comments were like, why is it symmetrical? It, apart from the zero, we have one, four, nine, six, five, six, nine, four, one. It's completely, this string right here, apart from the zero at the front, is symmetrical. Now, I do think I want to make a video that compiles some other symmetries like this in math, because we've seen some other times where something like this happened. One time was when we looked at continued fractions, and apart from a starting term, you get a symmetrical thing. But it's also reminiscent of a topic I have done already, which is palindromic numbers. Because if you, you know, treat these as digits in a number and strung them together, it would be a palindromic number. And palindromes are sort of like the easiest to understand type of symmetry in numbers. Of course, symmetry in numbers runs very deep. And if we do an episode about that, It'll have to hint at group theory, a big concept in math that's often described as ways things can be symmetric, because that is a accurate way you could describe it. And I, I mean, it's not the way I would necessarily first describe it, but it is an accurate lens. And with symmetry on the surface level, we can think maybe this repeating up to some almost like axis, five in the middle here was almost like an axis, maybe that repeating would be reminiscent, since we're multiplying something by itself, of, say, a multiplication table. And if you think of a multiplication table, it has its own symmetry. If it's not the diagonal that has this pattern going down, Funny enough, if we made a multiplication table, it's almost everything but the square numbers that are symmetric. Like, here's my little multiplication table. Zero conquers everyone. One times one times two times three. Two times two. Two times three and vice versa. Three times three and etc. In this case, if we take the diagonal line, those don't really have a symmetry on them yet, but all the rest of it does. It's like a flip sort of symmetry, almost like a parabola has around an axis, except tilted. Also reminiscent of when you make Pascal's triangle, where you have like a field of zeros, except a barrier of ones, and then from making your barrier of ones, you add together these two to get that and make your barrier of ones, add together with your barrier, add together, and so on. These are also known as binomial coefficients when you read them this way. And they're Pascal's triangle when you look at them this way. And they are the triangular, tetrahedral, and etc. numbers when you read them that way. 
very powerful thing that will certainly come up in multiple contexts this grade. In fact, one of the number patterns I'm most excited about presenting relates to this in a modular way. We put modular arithmetic on this to see a cool pattern. And then how I discovered a version of that pattern with a separate number thing I was fiddling around with that I'll show you. A cool thing I may have discovered that number ma numbers can make and do that if you apply a certain restriction at the beginning out of other possibilities, generated the same modular Pascal thing. And I figured out it was because of how certain numbers were secretly like a mod two addition in disguise. So we'll cover that for sure. Now, um, well, the reason I brought these up too is that one reason things like this could be symmetric in these cases, where it's not really like the square number is hitting themselves, it's things hitting other things, matching them hitting other things, is that multiplication and addition take two elements, they are binary operations, and they are commutative. A operation B equals B operation A. Not true for exponents. As we move on to exponents, you know, we can see that, you know, three squared is not two cubed. But two times three is definitely three times two. Same with pluses. And because of that, you'll often get like two times one happens and one times two happens. Something like that sometimes creates a symmetry. In this case, it's due to things you could connect to these for its own reason. Now, I'm not actually going to give the full answer to the symmetry now because I want to give make an episode about it, but I'm going to give a really big clue about it. Now, what we're doing here is squaring numbers. And normally, if we imagine these last digits, they go on a wheel, and they're basically the patterns we could call mod 10. That's like a clock that has um, 10 hours, except we're going to call the top one 0, not 10. And on this clock, as you go up the number line, if you're just talking about last digits, then you're going around this. My last digit is each of these one at a time, and I'm back to a zero, and keep going. So, in modular arithmetic, this is the big clue for people who want to figure out the symmetry. D maybe don't leave it in the chat if you know it, because I think it's a really good exercise for the brain, and it'll be in an episode, a few episodes from now I'll make, about cool symmetries like this in a slightly more refined way. But the big clue is that we can call in this mod nine hours after zero, one hour before. I'm putting this congruent thingy instead of an equals to be more technically accurate. But here we could call eight hours after, two hours before. So technically, not only in this mod 10 is 19 congruent to nine because they end in the same last digit, Negative one in a weird way is two because it's one less than a multiple of 10. Just that multiple of 10 is zero. So that's the really big clue for people who want to figure out this symmetry. What if you try and put these in terms of this? That's basically enough info to solve it on your own. And probably don't leave it in the chat because, you know, just you can feel proud if you know you already knew it when the episode drops. You can leave a comment on that episode saying, I already solved it from the stream. So, that's squares. So, since this was about squares, I decided, you know, we haven't talked much about modular exponents. I was saving that until we got through a slightly more basic operation, modular division, which was the topic of one of my more recent combo class episodes on that channel. And so, given that we've now gotten mildly comfortable, maybe not all of you, but you can still watch and understand half of it, but some of us have gotten mildly comfortable in the audience with that we can be in a different mod, Certain patterns will still hold, like in a different mod, whatever pattern makes these symmetric will make whatever other numbers are in that mod symmetric as well. 
Let's note that symmetry means that half of it tells us the info about all of it. Just sometimes you need to flip it. In fact, the flipping almost reminds me in a more philosophical way of if you wave at your reflection in a mirror, your reflection is waving from their perspective the opposite hand as your, you. Now, I want you to keep this all in mind for the next Combo Class episode too, because although it's mostly about this other base, there is a moment where symmetry comes up, where one of the cool abilities of this base relates to something you can do with an easier way than you'd expect, and the easiness is due to symmetry. So keep an eye out for that. Now, we're going to move on to modular exponentiation in a minute because we've covered the other simpler operations, which is what I'm saying some people have gotten comfortable with here. Uh, the addition, multiplication, subtraction on this type of wheel. But I also like to not only think of a modular thing as this wheel, but if you know what operation you're going to use, like addition or multiplication or whatever, as a little smaller version of a multiplication or addition table that repeats. And for example, let's see uh, what I mean is that, oops, spoiler alert of our next topic, not spoiler alert of anything except that zero to the zeroth power is indeterminate also in mod two. And yes, I agree with this demonstration. When I say that zero uh, to the zeroth power does not work in typical arithmetic, a lot of people say, no, it equals one. And it does often get assigned one in certain fields, such as combinatorics, but that doesn't mean on a big scale it equals one. There are occasions it's assigned zero as well. And on the big scale, since it can be assigned different things and it doesn't really work without making exceptions, it gets the title of indeterminate. Now, for those who wanna see how I didn't actually link this in, but it's very similar to what zero divided by zero does. One divided by zero is undefined. Zero divided by zero is often called an indeterminate form in a very similar way to this, to zero to the zeroth power. So I guess that's another deeper brain teaser for any viewers. This one you can leave an uh, answer or guess in the comments if you want. Why are zero to the zeroth power and zero divided by zero similar uh, in a way that makes them both different than one divided by zero? Not that any of them work in typical arithmetic. So someone said, how many times do I say mod? Many times, I'm sure. I even got in the habit where I think of modular as meaning clock-like or cyclical. And so I will call things modular and realize that that doesn't, not everyone associates that with modular arithmetic. Modular can also mean like composed of smaller parts or other things like that. But I, you know, got to be careful when I just use my math terms and assume everyone knows them. Now, somebody is saying, what if you do it counterclockwise? I'm not sure what you were referring to doing counterclockwise, but it, that is a clue about the symmetry there. Now, someone says they don't want to go back in time. It scares them. Now, if we ever try and go back in time, folks, we'll start simple. We'll start 2D before we send anything 3D back. And we'll start with the simplest regular polygon. We'll try and send an equilateral triangle back in time. So we'll see if we can achieve that someday. Now, Let's see, um, what we're gonna try here is looking at a few modular things that are gonna relate to clocks. And guys can feel free to debate the zero to the zero thing. Uh, remember that if you think you have something that makes a system work, others may point out inconsistencies they notice because sometimes the inconsistencies are sneaky. So feel free to, you know, uh, critique each other and build your answers if you have guesses on why these are called indeterminate. And there are many ways to explain it. Now, here what we're going to look at first is what type of thing we're dealing with here. We have a little Wolfram demonstration 
contributed by Rudolph Meradian with additional contributions by Rob Morris. So shout out to those people. And, uh-oh, this isn't sc moving or scrolling right. The video capture thing's frozen. I don't know why it did this again. Um, let's see if I can get it to move. I can't get this thing to change in the screen that you folks are seeing. So I'm going to have to open a new one of these. Um, one moment. I'm going to make myself big, but it still might look like chaos. You know, like I say, I'm not the tech wizard. People who are good at one thing aren't always good at everything. And I'm good at several things, which probably makes me bad at several other things, because humans only have so much time. And even people who use their time well, if you are disproportionately focused on certain things, you might uh, be behind on other things. So... I'm certainly in that category where there's things that I'm not very good at because I haven't dedicated time to them and where there is other things that I um, am quite good at because I've dedicated a lot of time to them. Now, here we go. We got a little demonstration that now I can actually make move for you folks. And what this demonstration does is it lets us change the base number here, the exponent number. And remember when I say base, when we're talking about something versus an exponent, it doesn't mean we're changing base. If anything, the thing similar to what numeral base we're in would be similar to what mod we're in, ironically. so. Maybe I'll try and call it the bottom number because we often, like, technically they call it a base versus an exponent. But I want us to be thinking of the mod as similar to the last digit in a base of a different sort. So I'm just going to call it the bottom number and the exponent. So now in mod 2, if we change... Okay, I'm just going to call them A and B. Just know that A is the one at the bottom, like it says right there. If we change A to say one, well, no matter what mod we're in, one to whatever power is still one. That's still not gonna get us anywhere that even needs to loop around the modular clock. But let's say we have two. Well, this is gonna now depend on our mod. If I'm in mod two, two to the zeroth power is one but all further powers of two are even, which mod two basically calculates because the last digit of a binary number is like mod two. And if the last digit of a binary number is zero, it's even. So here we can go up all these and it's all zero there. Let's say I was looking at powers of three mod two though. Now it's like, okay, I have one, 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 and these are stuck on one. So in the case of mod 2, it's simple enough that we'll notice a pretty quick pattern. Apart from the 0th power, which will be 1 for all these, 4 goes to 0, 5 stays on 1, 6 goes to 0, 7 goes to, stays on 1, 8 goes to 0, and I think many of you can notice the pattern is that an even A value or lower number is going to go to zero in the mod and a odd one won't. An odd one, no matter what power we take it to, won't ever be zero because that would make it even. And odd times odd is odd. So that to any power will stay odd. So... And remember, odd times odd equals odd is the same as saying in mod 2, 1 times 1 equals 1. In fact, we could say that equals 1 squared equals 1. So in a weird sense, this expression right here. Wait, no, can you not see any of it? It's not working. What? Is it really? Okay, it is. Cool. We were just, I'm just behind. Okay, I I panicked for a moment. I thought it wasn't working. 
I just have a delay that made it, based on my delay, it was back on that zero to the zeros indeterminate. And I was like, no, was it frozen on that the whole time? So, okay, it's not, we're good. So uh, this weird expression here, one squared is congruent to one mod two, weirdly is equivalent to the statement that an odd number times an odd number gives you another odd number. This one is equivalent to even times even is even. What about three evens? All right, we're going up to mod three. That's where the three evens and throds live. And yes, they did return in our episode about the new base coming tonight or tomorrow. I say tonight or tomorrow because I promised it tomorrow because I don't know when I'm going to have it finished. I'm still editing the episodes myself, which I do want to branch out and work with other editors so I can focus more on other aspects. But this is another one I am editing myself. And I finished filming some clips for it that I wanted to add some shots and the ending just today. So uh, I still have to do, you know, a couple of hours of editing before that thing's ready. And by a couple, I don't mean two, I just say a few hours of editing. So it does involve three vins as well as what I call pure three vins. You'll see what I mean in the episode. Now in mod three, zero to the zeroth power is no longer indeterminate. No, I'm kidding. That's going to still be the case for all these mods. So in mod three, one, of course, we saw stays at one. Three is going to do the thing two did before. It goes to zero. And remember how even ones went to zero and stayed there? So is this. But let's also note, if anything goes to zero, it's going to stay on zero. Because our next power of it is going to be multiplying that congruent by zero by it. And something times zero is zero. So at every stage of adding a power, it would stay at zero. So if you hit zero, you're kind of stuck there. Whereas, what if you hit one? Very different. If you hit one, your next power, if there's room for you in the mod, I'm looking at powers of six mod three, they wouldn't even be, you know, we would be calling six zero in this mod. So it's kind of cheating. It's bigger than the mod number. But let's say we're on mod 12 like a clock. We'll go back to three vins in a minute. If... I have something congruent to one. And in this case, it's the zero with power. So we get it for free, but this will always happen if we ever hit a congruent to one in this exponent thing. Well, the next power is higher than whatever got us one is going to be like multiplying that one by the number and give us the number itself. So if we ever see this base or lower number that's within the mod, to some exponent that gets us one, the next exponent will get the number itself and vice versa. If we ever have the number itself, it had to have come from one. So turns out zeros and ones are really important in these in a different way. Now, if any animators are out there, send me an email at combouniversity at gmail.com. If you wanna send me one thing I want is the mod tables where you see the multiplication tables and maybe the addition tables in different mods, you know, like mods two through 24 or whatever. But I want them just colored three colors. I want them to be colored one color for where zeros are on the table, one color for where ones are on the table and one color, not for the outside number, we need to see what's multiplying or adding to get what, but for the cells of where they multiply. One color for zeros, one color for ones, and one color for everything else. So that will actually show some interesting patterns. As usual, all these stream topics, 
will be clarified a lot more in future combo class episodes or bonus videos here or shorts or whatever. The live streams are kind of just me having fun, but I do end up giving a lot of extra hints about topics that some will show up in future episodes, some won't. This probably will. Now, this exact demonstration might not. We'll probably get a deeper look at it during the live stream now. For example, we're going to take a minute to think about clocks. What does this mean on clocks? Well, like, if I say I'm in mod 12, then my answer is going to be like an hour on the 12 hour type clock. If only I had a clock. Now, you can't even see many of them from here, but oh, you know my clocks. Now, if you have the hours, oh, this is actually handy. The only ones written are hours and the other stuff's pretty subtle. I guess usually the only things written that that's written is hours, but these easy to ignore the minutes. We're just going to look at the hours. And uh, this actually isn't the official hand. I just stuck it in there, so I can still rotate it. So let's say that I want to know. It's harder to make an analogy with exponentiation than multiplication, but it's like if you go six hours forward six times and you do that whole process six times, what do you end up on? Well, that would be six, and then I'm going to put three up here. And I end up on zero because it ends up hitting the zero and staying around there. What about five? If I go five hours, five times, and do that whole process five times. Well, that's going to end up getting me five hours on the 12-hour clock. What about if I went, did the whole process another time? Gets me to one. In fact, five alternates between one and five. So if I keep repeating that process of five times I do it, well, it's a little harder to make, like I said, an analogy for like, than multiplying two numbers, which is like go five hours, five times. Now we have to say go five hours, five times, all that five times or something. But we can still imagine it on a clock. And it tells us that five flip flops between one and five. Now, that's because from five, it ends up getting back to a one because five times five is one more than a multiple of 12. And so since we got to a one there, you know, I said, we're going to go back to the number itself. So if the number itself makes a one, we're going to have a two length cycle of what it does. So what we're going to look at someday in a more thorough episode is how long are the cycles for different numbers and different mods? So you see why I'm calling this a two length cycle. It has two values. It's alternating between. Well, what about seven? Seven also has a two length cycle. Nine is going to stay on itself. What about 10? 10 is going to get to four and stay there. What about four? Four also stays on four. Now, what if we're on a different mod? What if we are on mod 24 to talk about all the hours in a day? Well, first let's just look at the squareds because we didn't really get that far in the quadratic residues when we looked at that. We cut off at 12. So what do they look like here? Well, one, four, nine, 16. And 16 does get allowed in mod 24. It is under the mod number, so we haven't reset yet. It's, you know, an hour on a military time clock or the... That's what I, in my country, they call it military time when it starts at zero and goes to right before 24. But a lot of countries use that, I believe. I don't know the details. It's better. But, like, people don't believe me when I say we should replace the 12 with a zero. They, like, laugh, and then I'm like, no, 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 really, though. And they're like, what do you mean? 12 is zero on the clock. It's basically the same. And I'm like, well, yeah, it is basically the same. They're equivalent. But... Zero is the better version of 12. It also is not quite the same when we look at considering something like 1230 as a time is like 12 and halfway to the next hour. 1259 is like 
12 and a lot of a fraction that's almost a whole way to the next thing. So our time doesn't reset at the top. Our time resets at the one. So if you compare it to zero to 24 hours, the stretch we're using is one to almost 13. Why out of having zero to almost 24, 24 being your reset to zero in a day, did we pick one through 13 to be on the clocks? <laughs> Come on, society. All right, anyway, <laughs> anyway, if we look at the squares here, 16 would be allowed if we were talking about all the hours in a day. And since I said it's similar to the last digit in a base, still true because in base 24, you would have a single digit symbol for 16. And that would be the last digit of any number that ended in a four in that base squared. So, somebody said when I go on a rant, the viewer count goes up. Yeah, you guys got to get me frustrated more and then people will think it's funny. People do think it's funny when streamers get frustrated. The problem is I always talk about math and numbers and that makes me get in the mood of, oh, how beautiful. Same with nature. We do nature and I'm like, oh, what a, what a lovely life. Nobody wants to see their streamer do that. That's going to kill all the viewers. But no, I, that is what I like to do. But if you get me frustrated, you'll probably get the view count up. And that could happen if we talk about uh, societal structures like you know clocks are usually pretty good but they got that trait but don't get me started on calendars or the english language so what else do we got here we got these patterns and let's say what happens when we get up to 24 let's go backwards one four nine sixteen yep they're symmetric because these are the squares like i said and we said those are symmetric Let's get one more clue of something that would show up if I make a full episode about this, which is here's our mod, the one that's like the last digit in our base. Well, what if I do instead of squares, cubes? They're not quite symmetric. Let's see backwards. 13, 1, da, 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 forward, 1, 8, 13. Not quite symmetric, although they hit a lot of the same values. These are known as cubic residues, the values that you can get in this process. Or the cubic residues, mod 14 in this case. How to get to mod 14? Okay, here's mod 10. In our base, it can end in any of them. So those are called cubic residues. And base or mod 10 has no cubic non-residues. All the values are residues. But other ones, that's not always the case, but we're going to jump past cubes for a bit. Somebody asked um, how I pronounce certificate. I guess like that. That was, it came out casually before I even had the chance to like present it on a plate. Just came out and me trying to read the comment. Certificate, why do you ask? I don't really care about certificates usually, you know, certificates uh, remind me of like, you know, sort of awards or diplomas and stuff. And like I said, <laughs> sort of the first one of those, I've gotten some of those in my life for things like being an honors student or passing a belt in a martial art when I took martial arts for a while when I was younger or random stuff, but they didn't mean that much to me. I cared more about my projects and stuff. But the YouTube play button does feel like an award I really like. So that one I'm actually proud of because I've been watching YouTube my whole life. Now, somebody, um, um, people are saying random stuff in the comments, whatever. Have fun in the comments. Everything's okay so far. And we're going to skip past cubic residues for a minute and go to fourth powers. Because what I want to show for a sec is, what's up with the fourth powers? Well, 
We're only going to need to go up to 10 because then our cycle's repeating and we can see what happens up till there. One, six, one, six, five. Six, one, six, one. And back. What about backwards? One, six, one, six, five, six, one, six, one. Zero. So, to anybody who tried the challenge of thinking, and once again, uh, this isn't one to necessarily leave in the chat. I would rather people get to think about them than this themselves as a little brain challenge. But remember how I said you could try and figure out with this clue that you could look at nine after as one before? As why these quadratic residues landed in a symmetrical way. You won't always see the, the symmetrical list because if you list the quadratic residues, you're not going to list the repeats. But if we see how they got generated, it's symmetrical, apart from the zero. But can you think of why is a challenge that will show up in that you know episode I'll inevitably make about these things in a neater form? Can you think of why cubic residues would not emerge in a symmetrical way, but quartic, sometimes also called biquadratic, which are the fourth powers, those residues would be symmetric. These ones were symmetric. It's not just our base 10. You know, if we're in 12 right here, let's see, it goes one, one, four, wait, we want to be on, yeah, fourth powers. One, four, nine, four, one, zero one four nine four one zero they actually cycle a little quicker in this case they have their little symmetrical pattern tucked between zeros every six in this case somebody is asking if this is related to euler's theorem so euler has so many theorems named after him that it's hard to even know which one you're talking about but i'm assuming you mean the one that is the modular arithmetic Euler's theorem, which is an extension of one called Fermat's little theorem. And yes, for those who have heard that Fermat's last theorem was this grand conquest in math that was written in a margin and took hundreds of years to prove, that is true, and we will discuss that in an episode someday. But he also had a little theorem that will also be in an episode. Fermat, I mean, he had many theorems, but there's one that is called Fermat's little theorem. So... Fermat's little theorem is almost as important as his last one. And there is a generalized version of it called Euler's theorem. So, um, this stuff is related to Euler's theorem, yes. So, as far as which ones send you to a one, you know how I said that was important? Well, there's a lot of patterns for which ones send you to a one. And here I'm sort of leaving a lot of it up to your brains, like which patterns pop out at your eyes. There's so many possible ones to see as we flip through. But I'm going to pick a few of those patterns when I make an episode about it. And it's sort of going to go from something called Fermat's Little Theorem to that one called Euler's Theorem. Of course, Euler has so many things named after him that a lot of people call the thing... Euler's characteristic, like V, F, and E, adding and subtracting to two for planar graphs and certain types of polytope. There's another one that people call Euler's theorem, but we're going to call that Euler the Euler characteristic or Euler's characteristic because that's another name for it and is far clearer. Uh, you do have to love how... If you go on Wikipedia, I know I've showed this before, but I think it's pretty funny. Not only does Euler have a very long article about him, we also have one that is a um, list of, or here's his bibliography, but there's also something called, whoa, oh, here's a, whoa, there's a whole separate article. Oh my God, I was going to joke about how they have this article that's, um, list of things named after Euler. And not only is it really long, look at all these things named after Euler, and a lot of them have theorem in the name, uh, but they also note Euler's work touched on so many fields that he's often the earliest written reference on a given matter. In an effort to avoid naming everything after Euler, some discoveries and theorems are attributed to the first person to have proved them after Euler. I just think that's hilarious. If they didn't name some of this stuff after the second person to discover it, 
it would have had to name basically everything after Euler. So <laughs> it's funny because normally this is a sort of subjective sounding sentence to like stay on Wikipedia, but like any editor just agrees with it. Like, yeah, everything would have been named after Euler otherwise. <laughs> so, um, with a lot of confusing ones, but that's hilarious that I was trying to look up. Hey, look how long the article about list of things named after Euler is. I didn't even know there's a separate one called Contributions of Leonard Euler to Mathematics. Look at all this. That's some good reading if you ever want. This one is what I talked about with planar graphs having the Euler characteristic emerged from this sort of question. Can you cross all of these bridges once exactly? And there, of course, is Euler's identity that's classic. This thing, which is really just the neatest form that this thing comes in. And I will take a moment to note a lot of people I've heard say, this is better if you put tau in it. You can put tau, which is 2 pi, and then it's the plus is a minus. And that's about equally as good to me. I don't think, like, yes, that is cool. That shouldn't mean that because some people are big fans of tau and want it to replace pi, that there's anything wrong with this formula. Let's say it's about equally cool that e to the i tau minus 1 is 0 and e to the i pi plus 1 is 0. Now, I know a lot of people don't know why this is the case. We will cover it as we look at more of complex numbers, but it's a few steps out, like... I think you can understand if I showed here on the complex numbers, if I draw the unit circle, which passes through the points one, I, negative one and negative I, and has its center at zero. You can imagine that if I said, here we're at one, for some reason, like if you assume we're starting there and I want to end up there because my answer involves I am it plus one is zero could be phrased as e to the i pi equals negative one. So if I end up at negative one, I mean, we haven't explained the part of why you start at one, but if I end up at negative one, you can imagine that the pi part shows up in there because we've done that amount of a circle. We've done pi radians of a circle to go from one to negative one. And we have done tau radians of a circle if we went all the way back around. And so you can kind of get why the pi is in there. And well, how if the pi is there, the one makes sense. Now you can get how the I might show up because I was talking about complex numbers. The E is kind of the missing gap I'll have to fill in with an episode someday. Just know that E is a very fundamental thing to many rates of change and many functions that it often emerges as sort of the most natural version of something. Hence the name natural log. So, I would also like to note, if you replace, if you say e to the i tau equals 1, then it's not formatted how a lot of equations format stuff, and you lose this part of the trait, that it involves some of the five of the coolest constants of all time. Even if we say pi could be tau, I accept that. Either of them can represent the circle constant there. If you say it equals one on the other side, it's much simpler looking, but you lose this cool fact. And they didn't even mention another cool thing. So it involves these five simplest uh, constants in a way, really fundamental ones. But also, let's say you put tau there and a minus there. Then you'd lose this other trait. It involves the first three layers of the hyper operation hierarchy in terms of operations, which are the three that people are familiar with addition, multiplication and exponentiation. So it's pretty cool in that it combines E pi I one zero 
addition, multiplication, and exponentiation, and equalization, you know, being equal to something, exactly once each. So that's pretty neat. So I kind of like this formatting. Sorry, Tau heads. So this is a good article, probably. I'll probably read through this one later. I actually like Wikipedia's math articles, apart from that thing the other day about 123, where they're like, first number with one with digits one through three. Very bad uh, way they constructed some certain facts once in a while. Most of the time, they're good at writing their math stuff. There's holes in it. There's a lot of missing stuff I would have put in also if I had the time to edit it, but I don't. But except for when I edit in an article about three even numbers, which I'll do someday, that will be my first Wikipedia edit. Um, somebody is saying it is pi i as opposed to i pi. That is exactly the same. Um, so, you know, it might be some people consider it more formal to write the I after. I actually agree that it's weird that it's usually written this way. Is It's usually written in the less common way. But it's identical. You can say I3 is the same as 3I. But... Uh, it is written in the less common way of writing complex numbers is the more common way this is written, which is kind of weird. So I agree that pi i makes more sense. I think <laughs> this is a weird hypothesis. I think there's a chance that they didn't write it pi i so that when people write it out in words because they're like missing the symbol, it doesn't look as confusing. Like IPI looks a little neater than PII. That, that's a hypothesis as to one of the reasons they put it there. But in any case, I agree that it, it's neater the other way, but that doesn't mean this is wrong. Yeah. Now, someone says finding an I in your pi is worse than getting pi in your eye. Very true. So... Somebody also mentioned the basil problem. Now, that has come up in a short. That's when we take the reciprocals of the square numbers and add them all up and see that it does not diverge. It approaches a certain thing involving pi. That was one of the first things that Euler solved in a way that got him known in the mathematical community. Uh, it was called the basil problem, and that will show up in our episode about infinite series or in yeah that will be coming this grade sometime it will be in a way a two part episode although they won't necessarily be back to back because i feel like it would be pretty fun to make episodes about some of the really deep unsolved questions and it puts an extra hook in the episode when the question's worth a lot of money, which is, I don't care about that aspect as much, but it's a hook for the episode. And the Riemann hypothesis, which is one of the math problems worth a million dollars, that you, you will get a million dollars if you solve it with a thorough enough proof, is... And the, well, I actually want to make an episode compiling some of those, because there's seven from a main institute, but there's actually at least one more mathematical million-dollar problem I've read about. There's at least eight problems that are worth a million dollars, although now it's seven because one of them was solved, the Poincaré conjecture. But although the prize money was not claimed, long story we'll go and do someday, but I'll need to study the Poincaré conjecture before I make an episode about that. The Riemann hypothesis I'm about ready to make an episode about. However, to set it up, it would take the first half of the episode practically setting up the concept of taking an infinite sum that diverges or converges and how certain ones of them go to cool values and how those values are secretly just little parts of the Riemann zeta function. But essentially the reciprocals of the square numbers and the harmonic series, which is the reciprocals of all the natural numbers are series that are like little fragments of the Riemann zeta function. And so I need to make an episode that is just about my favorite infinite sums, not necessarily, I mean, apart from the deepest cores of the Riemann zeta hypothesis, 
but there's a lot of wacky ones. I showed once that the reciprocals of factorials relate to E, the reciprocals of squares relate to pi, the reciprocals of things like triangular numbers have a convergent value, and there's all sorts of fun ones. There's some that have really weird uh, values they converge to. So we're gonna just do one that's like a bunch of fun infinite sequences at some point that we add up so we can call them an infinite series. But in addition to that, Afterward, we'll do one that's just about the Riemann zeta problem. And it's basically a follow-up of that because of the last two, because of two of the things in that episode, one of which is really important, which is the harmonic series, being parts of that. The other of which being that Basel problem thing. Now, someone asked, um, who would pay you if you solve it? Why is it worth so much? Good question. Now, by the way, so two people have commented here, or maybe it's the same person twice, um, which is about how a pizza's with radius Z and thickness A, if you write out pi like this, and I guess one person commented just as a joke related to pi, and then the other person, it kind of makes sense here to make the joke. Uh is like, okay, there's your z squared, which we said z was the radius. There's your uh, thickness across. And then times pi is pi r squared. So it's true that, well, and so to get the thickness of a pizza that has a circular top and is basically a flat, thin cylinder, to get the cylinder, we can multiply the pi r squared by the height. So pi r squared times height will give us the 3D pizza. Now, I thought about that and I wanted to make a short where I found some of my own because I like that fact, but it, since I read it somewhere else once, I didn't want to like make it a short as if I had invented it. But I was like, can I think of others of my own to compile in a short? And I do have a few written down somewhere, which I was trying to think of other ones where it actually makes sense even more. Like Z being the radius and A being the thickness is... I guess, okay, A we can call altitude. That's kind of like height. So what what is can Z stand for that's like the radius? I don't know. But one I came up with where they can stand for things is a box with our first variable. We will say one of our distances here is X. And you know how you often label things like A, B, and etc. So we'll call our second one B. And then we will do one for the other dimension. So B for second, O for other, and X for our first variable. Well, our volume of our box is B O X. Let me know if you come up with any other ones. That's just what I thought of. I think I have a few other ones in my notes somewhere. <laughs> So, um, who, let me answer the, ooh, a squirrel just ran by, but I missed it. Don't worry, there's a squirrel we got earlier today that will be, actually, I think there's at least two squirrels in the episode coming this weekend. I've been spilling bird seed, and I need to refill the feeder again, but I've been spilling bird seed, and it makes the squirrels come more frequently and I like it. So they've been showing up more often in the episodes. I think every single like combo class main episode of grade negative two so far has had at least one squirrel, including the one that's coming out tonight or tomorrow. It's fun. I love that the animals still like me. They trust me and come close to me and stuff. Even when I'm like destroying crazy things, that shattering glass and burning stuff. The animals know I am good natured at heart and I would not hurt them. So they still trust me. Now, let's see. Somebody said, do they need to be smart to watch this? I'm going to answer that first. No, uh, it is good to watch things that are above your head. Some of my videos will be based on things that anyone who is past elementary school can hopefully get. Other of them, like this part of the stream, go off into tangents that you wouldn't understand all of unless you've, A, you know, maybe studied through more like high school math, and B, seen some of my videos already or studied those topics on your own. However, 
if you hear things that you don't fully understand yet, you can think about them from whatever context you can understand them. And then when you see them again in the future, if you do study it more thoroughly, then you'll kind of see it from a second light. You'll be like, oh yeah, this was the thing he was talking about with the clock. So what does this have to do with the clock? So it's good to see things in multiple lights. When I first got into watching math videos, uh, my two probably favorite math channels are probably 3Blue1Brown and Mathologer. I'll also give a shout out to Matt Parker at Stand Up Maths and to Brady at Numberphile. But my two favorites are probably 3Blue1Brown and Mathologer, apart from my own channels. Um, but I, I don't think I'm on their level yet. I think I will be making the greatest math videos on YouTube someday. But, you know, we're still in early grade negative two. Those channels have perfected a craft. And when I first started watching their videos some years ago, I didn't understand all of it. So I would just watch them, watch it a second time, look up some stuff on Wikipedia, and then still only three quarters understand the video. So for certain videos. And so it's good to watch stuff that's above your head sometimes. Then after I understood those topics more, sometimes I would like revisit the video and be like, Ah, oh, yes. Yeah, someone said new mathology today, out today. If you look at that video, I have one of the top comments because I saw that pop up and I love mathology. So I was like, oh, I'm going to watch that. Great video as usual. And I left a comment about how it was great. And it's one of the top comments. So uh, trust me, you can see the proof. You also can see my name in the credits at the end of the mathologers uh, since a few of them ago since I support him on Patreon with a few dollars a month, and he puts supporters' names in the credits. Like I do for certain tiers, although in the description here are names of all my Patreon supporters, and in the ending credits of the episode coming out on the Combo Class channel tonight or tomorrow, all of my $9 plus Patreons are on there. And... Make sure that you have checked that out if you have any extra budget, because it really helps us make our videos extra cool. Now, let's see. I kind of got sidetracked by thinking about how cool Euler's discoveries were and going to these Wikipedia pages. I will go back to the modular exponentiation a little bit, and we're just going to do a few clock analogies of it. And then I'm going to save the rest of our clock hopping for later. We also, after I take a brief break in a moment, we're going to see something cool in my front yard, which is there's the front yard that I share with a few other neighbors, but uh, on the side that's closer to my family's house, there are a lot of things blossoming. Uh, for example, the apple trees are making some new apples that aren't ready to eat, but are getting close. And there's also one that I want to show that I showed in a short. I forget if I showed in a stream last spring. I mean, obviously my short didn't come out then, but it was a short I filmed last spring. I think I put on YouTube, but I'm not even positive. But I mean, I didn't, I wasn't posting shorts back then. So I think later I put it on, but I'm not positive. It's a fruit in my front yard that has an edible flower petal that despite the fruit not being ready yet, the flower petals are ready so we, we can go eat one. So over here, let's just look at a few other patterns. Let's see what's up in mod 60 because in mod 60, that's like minutes on a clock. So if we're looking at squares, Yes, they will be symmetric. One, two, four, nine, sixteen, hopping up a bunch and going down all sorts of craziness. And they do, on the total, have a symmetrical pattern if we went backward from 60. One, four, nine, sixteen. And there's other patterns you might see in here. But let's take a concrete example. What if I go five hours? Oh, no, minutes this time. If I start at noon, and here's the thing. In my clock analogies, I usually say, assume we start at noon, what time do we end up on? But it, you could say, you start at any time, how far have we gone? Same thing. Now, 
we might as well reset that beginning to zero to keep the distance being the result. Now, we see that if we, you know, go five minutes, uh, five times, we end up 25 minutes. That hasn't looped around yet. What if we do this? What if we, five people each spin forward a clock's hours or minutes, five minutes, five times. Five people each do that to a clock. Well, now we have five cubed in our analogy. And it's back to five. Now, as we go to different powers, um, we can see that five here got sent from 25 and not by one because it's a little different here. We're going to have to go into the details more when I make a whole chart of these so we can see their patterns and their sequences. So five here goes through a two cycle. What about some other ones? Six stays at 36. And a lot of fun patterns to observe. So a lot of this was a casual version of a look through this. So, you know, stay tuned for a few episodes from now on the main combo class channel. I'll try and do one where we make this a little more concrete out of some of these patterns and answer that original symmetry question about my explanation for, you know, the logic of why these are symmetrical. Now, we're going to take a very brief break, and then we're going to look at an edible flower petal. So I need to run inside and grab some water, and I will be back in like three minutes ready to move the computer as well. And assuming, you know, my neighbors aren't using the front yard in some busy way right now, then I will move the computer to check out something cool. So we're going to be on Squirrel Watch. So, up there is where a squirrel might go by. Now, here's what we'll do to, you know, encourage the squirrels. They like the bird seed, and, well, there's a little bird seed that's spilled around here, so maybe if I put a few crumbs of it up here. Uh-oh. A squirrel will want to stop by and eat it. Who knows? So. Somebody better leave a comment to let me know if a squirrel runs by. Otherwise, I won't know when I'm time stamping it. So, I'll be back in a few minutes. Uh, chat about squirrels or exponents or whatever and edible flower petals.
All right, folks, how's the combo classroom been? Any squirrels while I was gone? So, let's see. Somebody says that Graham's number ends in a certain thing, uh, which is similar, remarkably is equal to three to something. And uh, that was probably solved by modular congruences to find all of those last digits. So these can help us discover last digits of massive numbers. Now, let's see what else. Somebody said a random paint splotch. Yep, so this was from a while ago when I was demonstrating on the Combo Class channel about primary colors and their relationship to Threven things. And we got some primary colors on there. Not all three of them. We just got two of the primary colors, but there's a little blue up there. So, yeah, I had to grab some stuff and get the front yard set up and such. And now we are going to take a visit to the front yard in a minute. And for a moment, I am going to shrink or vanish myself and replace myself with this thing. You can still hear me, hopefully. And, okay. Ooh, we got lucky there. We still had the audio on from my screen capture. That was the thing that cursed me once, that I tried to pull open the chat and it started playing a bunch of ads. And I couldn't, I didn't even know they were playing because I couldn't hear them, but the chat could. So, we dodged it. Now, let's um, take a peek at the cool plant I want to show you folks. And this cool plant is a, what I've called, and one of the names of is, a pineapple guava. Now, the pineapple guava, some call a feijoa, like F-E-I-J-O-A, if I'm pronouncing that correct. And we have a tree of them here. They taste really good. They are also part of what I call the edible peel conspiracy, that people don't realize how many fruit peels are edible. And the peel of the guava is edible. And sometimes I will, you know, not eat the whole peel, but a little bite of peel mixed in is pretty good. Now, right here, we have a pineapple guava tree that what I want to show you is how the actual guavas aren't quite ready. They're going to grow on these things. However, do you see that little white flowery thing? Can you see that? Where is the right angle of that? Let's see a bigger one. Well, let's, here's a clue of something. You see these little sprouts? What are those red things? Well, these little red things are parts of these edible flower petals. Now, I don't want to pick this whole thing off, but looking at it for a moment here, let me get a good angle. This is a flower petal that I can pluck one of these white things off. And if I eat it, it tastes really sweet. It tastes almost like the fruit. It would be good to like put on top of a salad of a strange sort or like a fruit salad maybe. They're edible completely and they're actually good. So sometimes people don't realize how much of a plant is edible from even the um, petals before you even get to the peel conspiracy. Now, let me pause this for a second because I don't want to show anything confidential here, but I do want to show you folks some other things we're going to get which we're going to see little flashes of momentarily, one at a time. And the first flash right here is next to one of these light things that I've shown that is collecting solar energy right now to use at night. We can see this is a fig. There are going to be figs. All right, now vanishing in between each little fruit I'm going to show you. That's how this is going to work. 
here we can see how we're going to get apples next to another one of these light things these are some flowers and it's hard to see the apples on that tree but this tree is already at the point where it's making little apples see those let's see it's hard to get a good view of them see those little apples those are tiny little apples right there these things so that is what we get for our garden peak today. Now, there is one more plant in the combo classroom, which is the potato plants, always fun to check on, which as a reminder is just a potato I sat down in this planter bin that got rained on, started rooting and made this whole thing. What the heck? made this whole thing. So, the potato plant, all growing out of that potato there. There's a separate one growing out of that little potato, but most of it's growing out of this potato. Is going, or there might be another potato or two in the mix, is going wild. So that's pretty cool. And that was our little nature break. Here's a little petal that fell on the computer from one of the apple trees. And I hope you enjoyed seeing a plant or two. I like doing plant breaks once in a while. And those will happen at time to time on this channel. Even on the main channel, I do little science-y snack breaks here and there. But sometimes here, even more so, we will take random nature ones. For example, one of the upcoming bonus videos I've mentioned that I still need to re-edit from my old computer is about some slender salamanders, a small creature that I found more of near the classroom. So that was cool. Now, that's most of what I have planned for today's stream. Feel free to leave some more comments before I vanish if you have any particular questions or anything you want to let me know. And there, that was, um, let me close that other one. I don't want to make any noise come through. So. Uh, leave any last thoughts or questions you have because I am going to log out this stream pretty soon. Uh, what I'm going to do is get back to some editing of that cool episode coming out tonight or tomorrow. I'm not sure if I'll finish it tonight or tomorrow, but one of those days we'll have a fun episode. Remember, that's on the main Combo Class channel. And I also put out a couple shorts on that channel that I didn't have notify people or go to notifications. It's funny how much the algorithm cares about how many you've put out. I knew this was going to be the case, but the shorts I put out on the Combo Class channel so far get almost no views compared to what my shorts on this channel get now because the algorithm likes this channel and the shorts algorithm, which is a whole separate thing mostly than how much they like you with your long videos. So that's strange, but we'll just keep rolling with the program because grade negative two worked even better than I thought. So a lot of fun stuff coming past that episode. We will have um, another stream on Monday because my month scheduled live streams. This was just a bonus one, but the ones that are at a fixed time are this month will be Mondays at 5 p.m. Pacific time for an hour or two. And... So I'll be back in that form on this channel. And after that, have some more shorts and bonus videos throughout the week and such. But mostly I'm excited about the main channel episodes I've cook I'm have i cooking up. Like I said, this one will be about 19 minutes. The one coming this weekend will be very mathematical, base related. But also, and even if you do know what base it's talking about, you should watch it because you might not know all of the abilities the base has um, or all the things it can do. And 
It also has some of the most fun chaos that we've done so far when filming Combo Class. So uh, we'll see some chaos uh, in that episode. Now, I love you all. Thank you for joining me in the live stream. I am going to put some timestamps on this in a minute and then get some editing done. And I will catch you all before long. If you want to have a chance of catching me sooner, make sure that you are tuned into those links like the main channel, the Discord, where a lot of people chat about cool stuff, the subreddit, and the Patreon. Thank you all so much. I love you. Hope you have a good day or night, and I'll see you in the next.